judging by Vladimir Putin's interview with Tucker Carlson, you may think that Russia has been persecuted by the West. Let me, in this video, give a little overview from the perspective of religion, uh, how that is not the case. This is, uh, again, not from the perspective of a politician. I'm not a politician. It's not from the perspective of a military expert or an economic expert. I don't know those things. Uh, this is from the perspective of someone who knows um, history and theology in the context of the Eastern churches and specifically the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Again, Mr. Putin's interview has a mixture of truth with half-truths and distortions. And for those of you who may not know very much about Eastern Europe or Russian Ukrainian history, it's hard to know uh, where the truth ends and where the lie begins. I'd like to, um, you know, take a big step back and look at the time of Peter the Great, uh, the, whom the Ukrainians call, you know, Peter II, uh, the beginning of what we now consider the Russian Empire. He despised the Uniates. These are the Eastern Catholics. Uh, he called, considered them a double monstrosity, uh, a religion for the deformed. And that negative attitude towards the Uniate or Greek Catholic or Eastern Rite Catholics continued after him uh, with Catherine the Great. That negative attitude uh, continued after her into the 1800s. And we see that um, with, uh, with her that there was the, um, the, the, the suppression of the Eastern Rite Catholics. By 1839, uh, she had died, I think, by 1796. By 1839, that the Eastern Catholic, uh, Greek Catholic Church had been abolished in Russia. By 1875, it had ceased to exist in the Russian Empire. So that gives you an idea of uh, uh, some of the um, intolerance or uh, fear that the, the Russian leadership has historically had for the Eastern Catholics. This is what President Putin was referring to in his, in his interview when he spoke about a religious union around the six minute mark, six and a half minute mark in the interview. These uh, Orthodox who came into union with Russia, with uh, the Catholic Church, excuse me, posed an existential threat to Russia. Russia views its people according historically according to the lines of ritual. And if someone was not with the Orthodox Church, they were not able to be uh, controlled. And for that reason, you see this uh, great persecution against the old believers. If you don't know much about the old believers, uh, it's worth studying. So this is not just an example of oh, the Russians being intolerant of Catholics. No, it's not just that. It is of their own Orthodox believers who see that the Orthodox Church historically has been instrumentalized by uh, the Kremlin for a political end. And people who just want to pray say, no way, we're going to pray our own way. And therefore, you get the Old Believer movement. It's much more complicated than that. I'm giving you the 30-second version of it. But this instrumentalization of the church by Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, um, and the various uh, czars down through the 19th century was continued in the Soviet era. And we see this uh, throughout the, the Soviet era with how they treated uh, people. And during the Second World War, how the uh, Soviet government uh, instrumentalized the Orthodox Church to use it as a means to... Uh, rally against the, the, the invading German Nazis and as a means to surveil their people internally and as a means through the World Council of Churches to um, uh, be the eyes and ears of Moscow abroad. Regarding the claim of Mr. Putin that, um, you know, the, the Poles were trying to um, Polonize uh, his Russian people. There's truth in that. Uh, and there's also truth in the claim that the Russians have been russifying uh, the, the Ukrainian people. You see, it's not 
blue and it's not red. It's purple. The Russians and the Poles have this tug of war in that land between them known as Ukraine. And that is the land where the Eastern Greek Catholic Church is today. It used to exist in Russia proper, up in Smolensk. It used to exist in Belarus. It used to exist in Central and Eastern Ukraine. That, those areas were the heartland of the Ukrainian, uh, of the Greek Catholic Church, the Ruthenian Church. Uh, but wherever the Russian Empire came, there that uniate Eastern Catholic Church ceased to exist. They were forcibly merged into the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, but what's interesting in this interview is when Mr. Putin speaks about the uh, attempt to Polonize uh, these Russian people, it's interesting because we see that when the Russians needed um, to exert um, a more orthodox influence over the peasantry, that they brought in uniate Greek Catholic priests from the Lviv area, Galicia, into places like Podilicia, which is a little further north towards Belarus, and Belarus, I think, mostly now, in order to uh, make the people there more orthodox or more eastern. You see, these are the lands that were dominated by Polish influence, yet when the Russians needed them uh, to, to uh, exert orthodox influence over their faithful, they didn't hesitate. This is important to know because it shows that uh, these Eastern Rite Catholics who were living in the Polish areas were themselves very Orthodox. There were different camps within the uh, Eastern Rite Church, and some of those camps were very pro-Latinization, pro-Polish uh, identity, and they had organs and pews and Polish hymns in their churches. But at the same time, there were very many uh, clergy members in this Eastern Rite Church who were very small O, uh, capital O, Orthodox in their style of liturgy. And they were never squashed and eliminated. So this, the claim that uh, the, the, the Eastern Rite churches that came into union with Rome uh, lost their identity uh, is not true. It's not true. Another thing to keep in mind is that uh, this claim, uh, an assertion by Mr. Putin, that uh, all of these influences come from, uh, from, from um, NATO uh, is simply not true. If you look prior to the existence of NATO and you look uh, at the religious history of Russia, you will see this tendency on the part of Russian leadership to vilify the foreigners. So there's an inherent xenophobia in the Russian mentality. I'm not speaking about uh, ordinary good God-fearing Russians, but I'm speaking about uh, the mentality of the Russian leadership, which has consistently uh, sought to vilify influences outside of its borders we can take a, an example of um, Blessed Fedorov. Leonid Fedorov was a um, uh, Russian through and through. And while he was studying at the academy, I think in St. Petersburg, he had an intellectual conversion to uh, Catholicism and he left to study in Rome and in Rome became Catholic, but he left the Jesuit institution he was in to become a Greek Catholic. And he was ordained in Constantinople and returned to Russia. And he returned to Russia and was uh, sentenced to prison uh, for the crime of being a Catholic. He was seen as being a, a papist agent. This mentality continued uh, after the revolution when the, 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 the communists arrested him and the, the same the same logic was, was, was used, and he eventually was imprisoned again, and um, he, he eventually died, a great confessor of the faith. But he had to face the same uh, accusations that 
Andrew Sheptitsky faced uh, from 1914 to 1918 under the Tsar. You know, Andrew Sheptitsky was the great uh, leader of the uh, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church um, from 1901 until 1944 in Western Ukraine. He was arrested in 1914 for this suspicion of being the same the same thing a, a spy for the for the pope or for the poles and the same accusations you know were were leveled against uh, Anna Aprikosova uh, I encourage you to read about her this is um uh, a woman who was described by bishop Pierre Naveau as a genuine preacher of the face of the faith and a very courageous woman he said that one felt feels insignificant beside someone of this moral stature. She was put into isolation for many years. I think originally she was sentenced to 10 years of solitary confinement. She was uh, sent into uh, the labor camps and all for the crime of, I want to read for you, uh, what they they accused her of being and it's like you're listening to uh mr vladimir putin this little old catholic nun uh was accused of being uh, a terrorist she was accused of uh for, for the the crime of having a convent in her apartment of fellow sisters who lived and prayed together of having a parochial school they were accused in 1924 of operating a terrorist organization for uh, operating an illegal school for children in a religious fascist spirit, the same lines of being fascists. They were accused of being co-conspirators with uh, the Holy See for the Republic of Lithuania, which uh, Putin refers to in his, um, in, his, in his interview, referring to the earlier uh, uh, Lithuanian uh, entity from the 14th century, of uh, conspiring to work with the Poles, the same thing Mr. Putin uh, speaks about, of uh, working for the extremist Ukrainians, the same thing Mr. Putin speaks about, of cooperating with the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, which Mr. Putin alludes to, uh, doesn't say the name. All of these are the same tired old uh, arguments and uh, attacks that the, the Russians have been using for over a century. You'd think they'd be more original. These things keep coming up, up and again and again. And you see, when she was uh, rearrested, this uh, Anna Aprikosova, the same old trite phrases were thrown at her of being a fascist, of uh, working to um, help the Vatican extend its influence over uh, the Russian people. These same old trite uh, insults keep being recycled and recycled. And people, they seem kind of new to us. But for anyone who's been familiar with Ukrainian, Russian, uh, Soviet uh, history, knows that these are the, the go-to insults used by Russian leadership to accuse people um, who are a threat to their people's independence of mind and spirit. They accuse these people of being agents of the Poles or of the uh, Greek Catholics or of the Pope or now of uh, the, the, the newest entity is NATO. Um, but we have to see through this and realize that uh, this is an attempt to keep her people from freedom. Uh, and that ultimate freedom is spiritual freedom, uh, freedom of being united to the Catholic Church. This is something that Russia has long feared. You know, Leonid Fedorov, Fedorov um, when he was, I'd say around 19, when he was a priest in Russia, uh, he was working with um, the uh, foreign aid mission from the United States. I forget his name, but they were meeting with Patriarch Tikhon and it was discovered that Patriarch Tikhon uh, was trying to work out a union uh, of the Orthodox with the Catholics, something that the Russian czars opposed and something that the Soviet authorities opposed. Why? Because a free, a religiously free people means an intellectually free people, which means 
a free people circumstantially. And this is what Russia fears for her own people today. You notice that in the interview with Tucker Carlson, they speak about, um, uh, they reference the persecution of Christians in Ukraine, which is nonsense. But if Tucker were a real and true journalist, he would have countered that by speaking about the state of the Greek Catholics in Russia, the state of the Ukrainian Orthodox in Russia. There are none. There is no Greek Catholic Church in Russia. There is, there are you know, Russian Orthodox in Ukraine. Uh, they, but now they, they, they call themselves the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, but they answer to, to Moscow. But why is that? Why is that, that there are no Eastern Rite Catholics in Russia? Why is it that there are no Ukrainian Orthodox in Russia? It's because Russia is not a free land. And Russia is intimidated by the thought of her people having religious freedom and praying in their own churches and having uh, religious leaders who are unanswerable to the Kremlin's power politics. This is what we're facing. And uh, Russia is trying to play the victim card. That freedom that they expect their believers to have in Ukraine, why don't they grant that same freedom to Catholics in Russia, the Greek Catholics in Russia, the Greek Catholic, the Ukrainian Greek Catholics in Russia, the Ukrainian Orthodox in Russia? It's a one-way street for them. Now, another thing I want to speak about that my Russian friends in Russia are not able to is the state of the Roman Catholics in Russia. This is something I, we haven't spoken about yet. But time and time and time and time again, good, God-fearing Roman Catholics in Russia have the threat of their priests and their bishops being deported, being denied visas, simply for the crime of believing the Catholic faith and acting on it. And what I'm getting at is evangelization. You know, only about 44% of the Russian population is actually Orthodox. And even a, a very small fraction of those actually go to church every Sunday. So that means that you have 56% of the population is, is, is not Orthodox. But you know, my brother priests in Russia, the sisters in Russia, they cannot evangelize. If they do, I know of one priest who set up a, uh, a slide in a little playground in his church property. And for that, his visa was suddenly not renewed. and He had to leave and go back to Italy. Why is that? It's again because the Russian leadership fears this, that her people will truly be convicted by faith in Christ and be free. They would prefer to have a nation of lemmings than to have a nation of free men and women in Christ. And this is what needs to be called out. The Vatican needs to call Russians out on this. And especially uh, the Russian leadership in the Russian Orthodox Church needs to be prophetic and no longer be the altar boy of Putin, but to prophetically proclaim truth and freedom in Christ. And in this, they will find that Russia's true conversion and renaissance will come about. But it begins with truth and calling out people like Tucker Carlson and Vladimir Putin on their half-truths. We need a free Russia. Please God, the prophecy of Fatima will be fulfilled and we will see that in our own lifetime. That the, Catholic, that the people of Russia will come back to the Catholic faith question is, will they be Russian Greek Catholic like Leonid Fedorov and Anna Abrikosova, or will they be Roman Catholic? But they need to come back into union with the full church. My preference is that it would be in the tradition of the uh, Constantinopolitan liturgy. God love you.